Report on a journey to the western states of North America, and a stay of several years along the Missouri, during the years 1824 to 1827. By Gottfried Duden, Thirteenth Letter, written in Montgomery County, Missouri. 20 February, 1825, Part 2, Number 18. Among the fruit trees, I must not omit the persimmon tree. One does not see it very often. Seen from the outside, the fruit resembles a yellow plum. However, it contains not a single stone, but several nuts like the medlar. Also, the calyx is permanent on top of the fruit. Before it is entirely ripe, it has an astringent quality and is therefore recommended for dysentery. When it is completely ripe, its delicious taste surpasses that of most of our varieties of plums. Most striking to me among all the fruits, however, was that of the pawpaw tree. The tree itself does not grow higher than about twenty feet, and it is rarely six inches in diameter. The blossom is a beautiful dark red bale, with five stamens and one pistil. I might compare the shape of the fruit with a short sausage, three inches long and one to two inches thick. The smooth green skin that surrounds the pulp changes upon ripening into a whitish yellow. Inside, there are several stones comparable to small chestnuts, which, when eaten, cause vomiting. The pulp surrounding these stones, which makes up by far the largest part of the fruit, is hard to distinguish from a well-prepared sweet custard, and for this reason it is a great favorite with children. Moreover, trees in the valleys as well as on the hills are the common indicator of rich soil. Palatable plums are also found in the woods. I do not conceal the fact from you that the entire life of the inhabitants of these regions seemed to me like a dream at first. Even now, after I have had three months to examine conditions more closely, it seems to me almost a fantasy when I consider what nature offers man here. But I shall write of this in more detail later. I do not know the summer as yet, and I am prepared to meet with some disagreeable conditions, because I do not expect so much goodwill to exist without some unpleasant features. For the time being, I will add only the following. I have settled down about fifty English miles above the mouth of the Missouri. There, near a stream in Montgomery County above the small river Osage Woman, I found very fertile, attractive areas that could be bought partly from the state and partly from private owners. My companion, Ludwig Eversmar, also decided to live for the time being not so very far from St. Louis. We bought a joint in land. He about 130 acres, I about 270. The land bought from the government costs one and one-fourth dollars three and one-eighth Dutch guilders per acre. And that brought, bought from private owners a little more. It is extremely alluring to settle down in regions where one has such complete freedom of choice, where one, map in hand, can roam through beautiful nature for hundreds of miles in order to select land and its cover of woods and meadows according to one's own desires. Here, attractive qualities are united with useful ones. Settling next to charming hills near never-failing springs, on banks of small rivers near their junction with large rivers, all depends entirely on the option of the settler, without taking the price into consideration. And what is perhaps still more important, one can choose the climate. From the Canadian Great Lakes to the Gulf of Mexico, the settler is faced with no difficulties. This is an area comparable to that extended from northern Germany to Africa, within which one finds large and small settlements everywhere. When several years ago the lands west of the Mississippi were suddenly opened, hordes of speculators swarmed over them. The prices were driven too high, and the result was that Later, they fell below with their true value. They are still very low now, and one can buy wonderful areas for two and a half to four dollars per acre that earlier was scarcely to be had for seven and eight dollars. 
To be sure, the price of grain during the European wars contributed to the rise in prices. It was too late to arrange for permanent settlements before the winter. For the time being, we stayed with farmers in the neighborhood. Now, however, the cold season is over and we shall try to transform part of the tree-covered hill slopes into a farm. I say the cold season is over. Those are the words of the Americans. I myself did not notice that it was winter. The woods never lost their green color entirely. Snow had not fallen and the temperature was so mild that one needed a fire only in the evening and in the morning. However, the inhabitants say that such weather is unusual and that the month of January is usually unpleasant. They also say that winter rarely comes earlier and that toward the middle of February navigation of the streams is already possible and no ice is seen on the rivers. Occasionally the Missouri as well as the Mississippi freeze over with such a firm layer of ice that large loaded wagons can be driven across them. This would not be true if it were not for the large masses of ice that float down the rivers from the far northern regions. Also, they say that the ice layer remains for scarcely eight days. In general, they praise the American autumn, and I must testify that beginning with August, we had excellent weather for traveling. At the present moment, we cannot get workmen. Everyone is occupied with making sugar. Old and young are engaged in this activity as if it were a continuous family celebration. I did not mention the species of maples among the trees of the forest. The sugar maple is so common along the Missouri that almost every settler owns his sugar grove, sugar camp, not infrequently quite near his farmstead, but sometimes one and even several miles away from it. In the latter case, the forest is usually government property. This manner of using public force is as customary among the rich and the poor as if it were permitted by state law. The first occupant is considered to have the right of priority, and only an actual purchaser of the land will disturb this arrangement. Toward the middle of February, the favorable weather begins, that is, when warm days follow rather cold nights, which is often the case here in February. This change causes the sap of the trees to rise in such a way that it often does not drip, but actually flows out of a damaged place in the wood. As soon as the right time has come, the entire family moves into the woods, where there is a spacious hut with a fireplace built to rust stones and large enough for four or five iron kettles. Holes are bored into the trees several feet above the ground. Large trunks may have several holes. Tubes of elder wood are then inserted in the holes, and troughs are placed under them. One can preserve these utensils from year to year. Usually, one person collects the content of the troughs and barrels and takes it to the fire by means of a sled drawn by horses, and there, a second person, usually the housewife, is occupied with the boiling down of the sap. While the children play around in the grass, she transfers the sap from the first kettle to the last, where it remains until it attains the consistency of the sugar and it is then poured out for cooling. Firewood, as one can imagine, is easily procured. If it has been carefully prepared, the sugar is preferred in color and taste to the best light yellow cane sugar, powdered sugar, and requires no purification for household use. If the weather is favorable, two persons can easily prepare two to three hundred pounds in one week without being hindered in the usual work of preparing daily meals. Although sugar could be made in the fall also, this is really done. At that time, there is other work to be done, and the farmer does not overwork himself or the negroes he may own. The price of maple sugar here is 10 cents, 15 farthings per pound. Almost every household uses about 100 pounds. No European poverty prevails here, where a day laborer with the hardiest appetite can earn as much in 12 hours as he consumes in an entire week in the way of meat, bread, vegetables, butter, milk, and brandy. I should add that the whites learned the uses of the maple tree from the Indian. While I watched the boiling syrup, I noticed a piece of fat on the liquid, which is said to prevent the syrup from boiling over, and evidently it does so. If you will remember, the story was told years ago that 
when there was danger of shipwreck barrels of oil had been broken open and that this oil had helped to calm the waves at first everyone considered the report incredible until benjamin franklin explained the reason for this phenomenon the same reason holds here syrup is prevented from boiling over by the lower specific weight of the fat this weight causes the fat by its effort to maintain its place on the highest spot of the wave to counteract the movement of boiling which is foreign to it a similar result can be expected from a large mass of oil on a stormy sea and bays and between islands especially when the cause of the motion the wind has subsided <laughs>